there's a very popular view going around that science and religion are essentially hostile to each other. They've been at war not only since the Enlightenment, but since ever uh, science started. That is regarded by serious historians of science, who are not necessarily all Christians by any means, as a myth. There are, of course, as is usual, reasons for the myth. And uh, often quoted are two incidents, historical incidents. First of all, the treatment of Galileo by the Roman Catholic Church. And secondly, the very famous debate between Thomas Henry Huxley, Darwin's bulldog, as he was called, and Bishop Soapy Sam Wilberforce in the Oxford Natural History Museum in 1860, a year after the publication of Darwin's Origin of Species. Now, serious historical work has been done on both of these incidents and the way they have become cultural icons used in the defense of this conflict thesis that religion is at war with science. And it has turned out that neither of those incidents will bear anything like the weight that is put on them. In fact, they do not confirm the conflict myth at all. Let's take very briefly Galileo. Galileo opposed the reigning Aristotelian notion that the earth was fixed at the center of the universe. And we are told that the church persecuted him for it and got him to recant his developing scientific views. But we need to be very careful because, first of all, the first opponents of Galileo weren't the church. They were the Italian philosophers who believed in Aristotle. Because the fact was that both the philosophers and the church had got committed to the reigning paradigm of Aristotelianism. And here was Galileo challenging it. It is a very big lesson, actually, that the church had rushed to ally itself to a reigning scientific paradigm of the time when that paradigm turned out to be false. And that's a warning, uh, perhaps, that sometimes people rush too quickly because science is in flux and is in change. But that's a separate lesson. The thing to be observed is this, that Galileo was not an atheist. Galileo was a believer in God. He was a believer in the Bible when all this started and when all it finished. He never changed his commitment to Scripture. So here's a believer in God that is supporting a scientific development that we now know to have been a correct one. And he was challenging the reigning philosophy of the time that was believed not simply by the church, but by everybody. So to see it as a conflict between science and religion is simply false. The next thing to notice is that Galileo wasn't the wisest of men. He uh, wrote a book uh, into which he put uh, the view of the then Pope, who had been his friend, but rapidly ceased not to be, he put the, the ideas of the Pope into the mouth of a figure he called Simplicio, the fool, which was not exactly calculated to win friends and influence people. So that that was a, a shooting himself in the foot, basically. He insisted on writing in Italian when the scholarly language of the day was Latin, and so the scholars didn't like him for that. And then in the background there was the Reformation and some of the leading intellects in the Reformation were espousing Copernicus's view and therefore Galileo could have been seen as supporting them. So there are all kinds of cultural reasons in the background that played a very big role indeed. The one thing that the story cannot be used for is to say here is uh, religion versus science, whereas atheism would have done a better job. Not at all. Galileo was a theist, a biblical theist. But Galileo was effectively pointing two lessons. One, science does change. And two, for those people who believe in the Bible, they need to be careful how they interpret it. Because there's not a person today, I would suspect, who would 
understand that when the Bible talks about the earth resting on pillars, they would take that to be literal in the sense there were huge big concrete columns supporting the earth sort of fixed and it couldn't move. But be careful with the word literal even, because what those metaphors are referring to are very real stabilities. We now know the stability of the earth is a very sophisticated thing indeed, but it is real, that is, is literal at another level. So we need to be careful too when we run away with the idea that because some of the Bible is written in poetic language, that what it says is not referring to something real. That is to make a very silly mistake in the way in which we understand literature. The second story, Huxley and Wilberforce, is again often painted as the triumph of rational atheism and science in the person of Huxley against an ignorant cleric, uh, Bishop Wilberforce. But the interesting thing is that Wilberforce uh, wrote a, uh, quite a lengthy paper, which I've read, in which he says that he's not going to use religious arguments because this is a scientific debate. So far from a religious man using religious arguments, it's not. It's a person who was a gifted amateur scientist presenting such a convincing case that Darwin himself called it uncommonly brilliant. He'd found all the weak points in uh, his theory. And in fact, somebody is said to have been deconverted from evolution by listening that day. The only records we've got of the actual event say that each man found a foe worthy of his steel. The honours were just about equal. If we look at it in its cultural setting, there's very much more afoot than is apparent in what I've already said. And the main thing being that Cuxley was on a crusade to promote a professional class of scientists. He didn't want any more these clerics, these amateur naturalists. He wanted science to be the business of professionals. Indeed, he wanted a church scientific as they spoke of in those days. And so the legend of a conquered bishop slain by a brilliant scientist suited the cause of the day. But historians have long since recognized that this is the case. And therefore, a serious historian would not use this incident as an evidence for the truth of the conflict metaphor. And in fact, one could sum up and say in the words of Colin Russell, who's a professor of the history of science at the Open University in Britain, that the conflict metaphor is so extremely not congruent with the actual facts that what needs to be explained, and I am quoting him, what needs to be explained is how it ever could have arisen in the first place. To put alongside that the simple fact that far from religion and science being in conflict, Christianity was the cradle out of which science grew. And C.S. Lewis sums up uh, Sir Alfred North Whitehead's work on this and Merton's thesis and various other things magnificently in the following statement. He says, men became scientific because they expected law in nature and they expected law in nature because they believed in the lawgiver. Far from religion hindering the progress of science, it was the basic conviction that there was a God, a lawgiver, behind this perceived order that spurred people on like Newton and Kepler and Galileo and so on to make the magnificent contributions to science that they did.